Okay, I'm back with another video um, lesson. And this video is <clears throat> going to be on how I translate information garnered from the standard negative and how I use it when printing. Um, this is, I'm afraid it's becoming a lost skill um, and that's why I, I'm trying to post lessons that you can't find uh, elsewhere that I notice is, is missing from any photography lessons on YouTube so <clears throat> so that's that's why I'm, I'm posting this one now it's it's got more math than all the other videos I put on but for those of you interested I thought I should put it out there so that the, the information is available. Okay. And I thought I'd start with the reason why I chose the subject matter that I shot to demonstrate this. Um, and I remember when I was young, I used to lay on the grass and look up at the sky. And I always found it interesting to look at the clouds as they pass above my head and I'd feel so small and yet I felt that the world was kind of miraculous. The fact that there would be these clouds that um, would constantly change and when I was older and I came across um, the work of Alfred Stiglitz. He used the term equivalent to describe his photographs. He said when he made a photograph, it represented um, what he saw and felt at the time that he made the exposure and it was the equivalent of that and that's what he referred to his photographs as, as equivalents and he made it a point to photograph clouds. Well, when I saw his cloud images in New York, um, I immediately understood where he was coming from because I was always intrigued by clouds. Um, although the photographs lacked a lot of the feeling that I got when looking at clouds. Um, but nevertheless, it made a, um, an impact on me. And so I thought I would shoot some clouds for this. It was something that I've been thinking about doing because I thought, well, maybe I could do a better job at capturing the feeling that I got. And I've said before in, in another lesson that you can never equal, you can never equal the beauty that Mother Nature provides, no matter how good of an artist you are. This is kind of a, a frustrating thing um, for me personally when, I, when I, I see these images that are just so gorgeous and I know that I can't do it. I can't capture all the different shades of colors and tones that Mother provides. But anyway, so that was the basis behind um, doing this. Now, another thing I thought I would, and I've showed this before, but this is a, uh, you'll notice the, the reading. The light that falls on this sensor gives you a numeric readout. And this is placed on the easel, the light coming down. And as you adjust your f-stop, you can effectively get whatever reading you want and this is how I standardize my uh, light level in the darkroom at 2.2 so I get 220 and that becomes a standard it's just uh, something that works I could use 2.0 2.1 it doesn't matter but but one thing I wanted to to say right here before I get any further is you can use this to maintain a constant light source so that if you use 10 seconds at 2.2 .2, you 
you're going to be getting the same amount of exposure on your paper. Now, this is not calibrated to um, at where 3.0 equals one stop. We tried to make it somewhere around there, but because we didn't, um, it, it's just it runs off a nine volt battery, and and we don't we didn't design it to that spec. Now, very expensive light meters on easel meters, you know, they are calibrated so that when you get a, a needle reading of 30 points, it's indeed one stop. That I think it takes a lot more engineering than we we had. But what you can do, and, and what I did was I took um, my enlarger and I set it at f11, and I raised and lowered it, focusing the light until I got 2.2. So I knew that I'm going to write this down so that I knew that f11. equals 2.2 on my light level okay okay then I opened up one stop and I went to f8 and the reading that I got from f8 was 2.54 okay then I went to f 5.6 and I got 2.83 now this is something that I just keep in the dark room because I I know what one stop deviation is and you'll notice it's not exactly 0.3 but it is in fact one stop. Now I used a 150 millimeter lens, um, which is my normal lens. And um, so opening up one stop, this is one stop brighter than 2.2, and this is one stop brighter more, okay? So when I went to F16, I got 1.87. And when I went to F22, I got 1.54. So I have this posted in the dark room. I actually have other settings too. I Sometimes I use 2.0, so I have one for that as well. But that is how I... Uh, know what my equivalent light level is if I'm making a large print and I can't get 2.2 or I want to close down at least one stop then I know I can get 2.54 or 1.87 and then I'll double my time and I'll get the equivalent exposure at 2.2 so I just wanted to say that and this is what I use for that so, getting back to the cloud images, I went and um, on a particular day when the clouds looked fairly spectacular to me, I went out and I shot a whole row of cloud images. And I, did, I knew I wasn't going to get maximum black because it wasn't that kind of a picture. But I read the highlights the brightest part of the clouds and I placed it in zone 8 and I knew that because I can't measure such fine the fine detail of the highlights I knew that I'd get more exposure in the upper part of that curve and I shot this row here so and by the way this is um, a 6x9 camera, 120 film. And I processed this 
the way that I um, describe in one of my videos where I, I think I called it how I process roll film or 120 roll film. And I don't do it in a tank. I use my hand. I, I go into the tray and I, and I demonstrate how, because someone asked me how I did that. Um, I mentioned it in passing. It was the way that I was able to achieve really even development. And I can guarantee that if I had processed this in a reel, there'd be over agitation on the edge of this. But you can see that this came out very even. And I think this is similar to the Jobo process, uh, which I don't have. I mean, it's, it's not an inexpensive processor. But John Sexton swears by the Jobo that is very even, and I trust John Sexton. So, um, but I don't have that. So I do it like this. I process one roll at a time, and that's how I was able to get such even development. You'll notice that there's no uneven development at all. And I learned this from Newbar, my old friend Newbar. Anyway. Um, you can check out that video if you want to know more about how I process it. But this is how it came out. And I placed this very high, um, the, the brightest part of the picture in zone 8 so that it would um, give it a good amount of exposure and more where I couldn't measure it. Okay, now once I process this, I didn't make this print yet, okay? I just had to film, but I had this. This is my standard negative, um, well, contact for my standard negative. And above here, I just simply wrote down the measurements that I get on my densitometer from the negative that made this print. And I do this so that I don't have to keep reading it. I take it out and read I just, now, <clears throat> I did write a software with my brother about 30 years ago, 35 years ago, where all this was in the computer. So, you you know, all these numbers and all these exposures. And, and that software was very, very valuable when I was in the photo lab business. Um, basically, I'm, I'm, t I'm showing you the math within that software um, manually so that you'll have it. But that software dealt with color, and it had a lot more numbers than we're dealing with, because we're only working with black and white here. In color, you've got three layers of emulsion that are mainly sensitive to either red, green, or blue. And so um, the in color enlarger has dials with dichroic filters, which when you place them more in line with the exposing light, you get more filtration. Well, there are numbers on these, these styles, 5, 10, 20, 30, yellow. you got yellow, magenta, and you've got cyan. And those numbers are just estimates. When you dial in 5 yellow, you don't really get 5 yellow. You might get 4, 3, 7, depending on the make, depending on how much the filters have faded and, and so forth. So our software took an on easel meter, not this one, an expensive one. <laughs> and in every enlarger we had, I would dial in five and I'd write it down. And, and the computer stored for that dark room what 87 yellow really was, you know, how, at what point on. Um. So anyway, it memorized every dark room, every enlarger, so that when I went and translated from one dark to the other, it knew, because it had a standard negative, it knew that 87 yellow was equivalent to 97 in this dark room and so forth. Um, the computer is really good at that. Um, but we're not dealing with color, so it, it's, just, it's just much simpler to explain. But what I did here was I knew that if I wanted the clouds to be in a certain part of this picture, in this frame, I don't know if you can see that. Okay, yeah. So looking at this on the light table, 
I determined that <clears throat> I wanted the clouds to be somewhere around here. And so I took um, this reading, 125, as my um, aim, so to speak. And then I measured this negative in that area. And I get 122 or whatever. And the deviation between this and the standard gives me my exposure. I know that if I go into this paper and I use um, 15 seconds at 2.2, I will get this density through that patch, that step of the grayscale. And this being different by so much, if I adjust the exposure by so much, then I can ensure that I will get on my contact roof that density. It's kind of a... Um, <clears throat> it takes a while to get used to thinking like this but it saves you so much time because then you can make a, a print um, it's a good idea to, to still make a test because um, this might have been made last year on a totally different emulsion and even though Ilford tries to be consistent in how they manufacture paper they may be they may have drifted you know 20 yellow uh isn't the same as a year ago this not this paper requires 15 or, and so this gives you a very good starting point in other words in this case i had just done this and this is the same emulsion and so i was fairly sure that um my contact would be correct and so anyway I, you know i made this contact proof and then this based on this and is made with 20 yellow same as this so it's very soft i then go onto the same paper and i make a five by seven and that's where i do my um evaluation of the negative i happen to have chosen this negative which is this one and I made this is 20 yellow 2.2 at 14 seconds okay oh one thing I want to show you this is important and you might want to copy this I'm going to turn the camera so you can see this This is something that I can't explain the math because, believe it or not, I'm not that great at math. <laughs> um, but this is logarithms, right? Now, we know <clears throat> that 0.3 on the densitometer equals one stop. So if your negative, the negative that you shot, Okay, this one is higher than the negative that made this, then you know this is going to require more exposure because it's denser, okay? And if it's denser by exactly 0.3, you just double the exposure. So instead of 10 seconds, you use 20 seconds. If it's less than um, this negative by 30, you just cut the exposure in half cut 50 percent but the in-between numbers are, are are not as straightforward so I made this chart um, just this morning <laughs> so if the density reading is higher than the standard negative by 0.05 add 12 percent so you can just use a calculator and you can say 15 plus 12 percent and you can use 16 point eight okay um if it's higher by point one zero at twenty six percent forty one percent point two zero at fifty eight percent so obviously if it's in between you can do some some number in between 
On the other hand, if the density reading is lower than the standard, then you would subtract 11%, not 12. And uh, whereas here you would add 26%, you're going to subtract 21%. It's because it's logarithmic and the formula is not that straightforward. I don't know the formula. I did this in Excel and, <clears throat> and I'm just passing it on to you. So obviously if you're, if it's, it's less than the standard by 0.6, you just cut two stops. So you cut, you cut the time in half, cut the time in half again and then you'll have two stops. But if it falls in between, you can do this. So with this chart, you can get a very good estimate of how to alter your, your um, exposing time to accommodate your personal negative as compared to the standard negative. Hope this makes sense. Another thing you do, of course, is you can just simply, I mean, if it's, if it's, if your negative is, uh, less than the standard by one stop, another thing you can do is you can, instead of use doing 2.2, use 1.87 at the same exposing time. Does that make sense? Okay. So yeah, you can copy this. Or you can try to figure out the formula if, but this is what I use, okay? Okay, so, uh, back here. <clears throat> okay. So, getting back to this. Now this, this is Ilford RC paper. It's still like, I don't know, 50 cents a square foot. It's not cheap, this paper. So, um, yeah, coming from the early 1960s is when I started printing. I mean, paper's gone, um, gotten very expensive now. But this I made with uh, 20 yellow, 14 seconds, 2.2. And then I increased the contrast I went to 53 magenta, 2.2 of 14 seconds. So you can see the increase in contrast. And I wanted still more contrast, so I settled on 70 at 2.2, 14. You'll notice that this says no mask. So I didn't mask this nail. By the way, I did shoot. <laughs> I did shoot two identical, one after, and I thought I would mask one. So I did that. I, I, this one's not masked. This one I masked. I just wanted to play with some ideas. Masking just for the FOMA paper. But that's another story. Okay, so this is what I settled on. So you can see the increase in contrast. This is 70 magenta 2.2. 14 seconds. So here I used three sheets. And I was able to get a reasonable likeness of what I could expect from this negative. No burning, no dodging, just a straight print. Okay. Then, I decided to make a 16 by 20. Um, so, at this point, I have to refer to my other paper. If I'm going to print this on Ilford fiber-based paper, now I have to compare my standard with um, between those two papers. You know, some people prefer to just go in the dark room and start from scratch and and just. But I prefer to do this. I mean, I did that for years. So I had done these, um, incidentally, just in the previous video where I demonstrated how to um, 
use the standard egg to compare papers. So this here is um, the Ilford RC paper. And this happens to be 70 magenta. So this is what I wound up using. Now I have to go to the fiber-based Ilford paper. This is all fiber-based. And 70 doesn't look like this. So I have to find what Ilford paper what balance I used and um, what did I wind up using right here <laughs> okay so this is where it begins to make sense so when I line up the Ilford this is 40 magenta next to the 70 you can see that the steps are very close now. So now I know to use 40 if I'm going to use this paper to equal this. This is the value of the standard negative. And this is how um, you can save a lot of time. Because if you don't do this and you just use 20 magenta, and, you know, let's try 15, let's try 30. You, you know, after five sheets of paper, you, you get to this point, right? And this is almost $2 a square foot, this paper. Well, the, the Ilford is less than $2, but the FOMA, FOMA paper is over $2 a square foot. I, I think it just costs that much because of the shipping. You charge a lot. So then I wind up using... Um, 40 magenta when I used 70 for the RC paper. Now look at the density difference. This is 20, and that's this took 20 seconds, and this took 11 and a half seconds. Okay. So now I have not only do I have the filter pack, but I know the difference in density. Um, I know that I'm going to cut. Whatever I used for this, I'm going to have to cut that exposure by the equal amount to get to 11. So if I say 11.5 divided by 20, I'm using 0.575. That's my factor. So this, because you keep records, is 14 seconds. This times 14, I'm going to use 8 seconds for this paper. Does that make sense? Hopefully, you know, this is how I think, okay? This is how I work. And the more you do it, the faster you get at it, and the more sense it makes. So 8 seconds, but guess what? When I enlarge up to a 16 by 20, I can't use 8 seconds because I can't get 2.2. So what did I use? I used 1.54. And then 8 becomes 16. 16 becomes 32. So I figured my exposure is around 32 seconds. And then I make my tests. And rather than use 32 seconds, I used 30 seconds. And I used, uh, this is probably 38 seconds. So I, instead of making a whole bunch of series, I just make two, because I figure it's gonna be round here. So this is, and this compared to this, came out pretty good. Now this is fiber paper and this is RC paper. So after I made this, and I just made one at 35 seconds, I determined, you know, you can actually find this 
area relative to this. Now it's going to be different because it's not the same paper. This is the resin coated paper and this is fiber paper. But it was close enough for me to go ahead and make this print. I should back up and show you this one. So this is printed on 16 inch paper. Straight print, no brain, no dodging. That's about 45 minutes of spotting, though. <laughs> the problem with cloud pictures is you get a lot of dust, especially when you're printing between glass. So it's like getting every little dust um, spotted. And it's definitely not equivalent to what I saw and felt. But it's maybe 20% there because it's pretty spectacular when you look at clouds in real life, you know. Okay, so. Um, I think I covered everything. Didn't, I don't want to give you any false information. I want to be as accurate as possible. That's why I wrote out that chart. Um, although I can't give you the formula because I don't know it. Um, and lastly, I would say that I suspect a lot of people feel that Photography and even darkroom work is a very creative process. And because it's creative, we don't want to rely on the science, but science is a good part. I mean, photography is an art, but it's imbued with science. You can't get away from it. Even digital photography uses so much science. Um, and there are, I have to admit, there have been a lot of books that I read where the examples are so uncreative that you do get this feeling that scientists do, don't make good photographers, even though they're brilliant in their own way, in other ways. You know. And for many years when I did photography, I was creative. I was I, f I was proud of being creative. I felt like I stood out. Being, I would print. Uh, I remember doing portraits of people and the background might be not the best because these are candidates and you just, but it was a good shot of this, this person. It was a good expression, but the, because the background was disturbing, I would print just their head and block the rest of the light and then I would re and after I printed that then I would block their head and throw the larger in and out of focus with the focus knob and blur the background to me that was very creative and I enjoyed doing that and when I was a kid I did a lot of stuff I mean I I would do solarization I made a negative and positive films of an image and and sandwiched positives together off register and stuff and I did all this stuff and and that's all valid and this kind of using tools and science to further your printing and your photography does not diminish any of that I don't think um, but I'm afraid that there might be a lot of photographers out there prejudiced against being so technical um, as if it destroys their creativity. If that's the case, then this video is not for you. This is made for those who want to um, utilize their time 
and spend um, less money because, you know, I used this and I made that. That's pretty frugal, you know. I don't waste a lot of paper. I don't waste, you know, <clears throat> if I waste anything, it's chemicals because I'll, I'll dump chemistry if I get to a point where I feel like, oh, um, I don't want to overutilize it because my masters rely on fresh chemistry. So, so anyway, that's it. Um, I just wanted to put this out there because it's going to become lost. This, you know, even when I was in the business of making prints for a living, in which case, really, you, you really do want to save on material costs. But anyway, when I was, people didn't use this knowledge. Uh, very few people, they relied on video analyzers and couldn't be bothered with uh, the math. Okay? All right, that's it.